Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar organized for the crowd modeling community of practice. Um, I'm Annabel Molero. I'm coordinating the crowd modeling community of practice, and I'm here today to present you um, the speakers to facilitate the webinar and help you to solve any doubts you might have during the, the webinar. Also, uh, Maria Camila Gomez is going to help us uh, with the questions and the technical issues. And Matthew Reynolds, the Chrome Modern Community of Practice Leader is gonna select the questions and also do a final wrap up. So before starting, I would like to know if you can hear me and see me properly. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me properly? Is the quality of the connection good? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so. If you have any any issues, so just uh, please use the chat to communicate with us. Thank you everyone for joining this webinar and thank you for waiting to the ones who uh, joined a little bit earlier. Um, so we are very happy to have people from so many parts of the world, Thailand, Mexico, so for someone is already very late in the afternoon, for someone is very early in the morning, so we really appreciate that you can make it. We have all, uh, organized other webinars our community of practice, as you can see in the link that is appearing now, we have done also webinars about DISA, uh, model, Chrome models like DISA, Wofos, AppSim, also about secondary data sources and about platforms like Guardian. So please stay tuned because we have done webinars and we are planning to do more webinars. So unfortunately, one of our speakers uh, for today, due to some uh, unforeseen familiar situation, cannot join. But instead of Julian Ramirez, we will have uh, Diego Not, um, Notello Pequeno, who is going uh, to supply him. And also Jana Kolova is going to help us with the part he was supposed to do. And I'm really pleased to welcome today our experts for this webinar. Jana Kolova is a senior scientist in crop physiology and modeling at ICRISAT in India and is responsible for development of tool, tools, technologies, and protocols to capture the key plant processes useful in crop improvement and crop model functions and integrate them into the interdisciplinary crop improvement pipelines. Diego Pequeno is an associate scientist um, and with a crop model at CIMIT in Mexico. He's a format crop physiologist, a crop modeler, and also a DSAT developer. So he uses high performance computing clusters to run gridded crop model simulations for current and future climate scenarios on a global scale. Finally, Stefan Einerson is the Director of Translational Learning and Head of IT in the International Programs at Cornell University. He is collaborating with Excellence in Breathing Platform and other international teams where technology infrastructure and data sharing are key issues, having also some modeling expert experience. So here very briefly, uh, <clears throat> like the agenda for the webinar today. So our speakers are going to present the target population of environments approach, uh, also known simply as TPE, and how the use of TPE can help crop improvements programs. During the webinar uh, registration, we asked uh, how many people is using TPE analysis. And it seems that less than 20% of you are using TPE analysis in your research program. But it turns out that the main reason is like around 65% of the people who registered for this webinar have never heard about TPE analysis before. So we hope that after this webinar, this will be solved and more people know uh, why TPE is uh, useful because this webinar will introduce you in the TPE analysis. So why is important, why you should care about it, and also the panelists will present some examples of the experience using TPE and how other research fellows can benefit from it and some global, capa global capacities for TPE analysis. And another like further objective of this webinar is to bring different TPE experts and users together to lead an even bigger effort on TPE analysis within CGIR and collaborators. So we would like to create an expert task force uh, to bring up all the TPE issues, improvements, needs, gaps, and ways of collaboration across CGR centers, and to move um, for, uh, all together to move forward towards this TPE approach. Um, so after this webinar, I will send a link about the webinar satisfaction. I will be very grateful if you can 
reply uh, this survey. It's, it's going to take less than three minutes. And also for people interested to be part of this TPE force, uh, it will be nice if you can add your, so how you would like to be involved and your email address in order we can keep in touch with you. So at the, after the presentation, we will have, um, unfortunately, a little bit short question and answer section. So please, all the questions you have that have not been replied during the webinar, so type them in the question and answer sections, and we will try to answer them either during the webinar or after the webinar, if they are really related with the webinar topic. So thanks for your participation and enjoy the webinar. And now, Jana, I'm going to turn it over to you for starting your presentation. So thank you. Yeah, I hope uh, you can hear me. Yes, we can, Jana. Now I hope you can also see me. <laughs> so thanks so much, uh, Annabelle, for introduction. So let the show begin. Uh, it looks like we have a good crowd out there and uh, as uh, Annabelle was saying, the first part will be taken care uh, about by me and Diego. So TP and beyond, let's begin. So the overview of first part, uh, I will go about it a little bit uh, generically because a lot of uh, audience didn't actually have experience with this type of analysis. So uh, why it is needed is the first part. Then we will look at the classical approaches, which uh, maybe many of you are using now and uh, how this TP kind of approach could bring some novelty to whatever people have been doing uh, before. And uh, my beloved uh, practical example from the private uh, breeding sector, which is very well documented. And then we will take a deep breath and go to the part two. So uh, first one, so uh, many of us are from the CG centers. So why do we actually care about all these uh, analyses which aim for understanding the environment? So we are here to uh, to address uh, the greatest challenges of the humanities, which uh, currently are there across the globe. Uh, all together, we are uh, actually working to, get, uh, to um, address the agriculture systems in developing countries, and they are inevitably characterized by the very large complexities. So a uh, big part of our efforts is actually crop improvement. I hope I don't need to emphasize this. And we, we are lucky to have this platform, Excellence is Breeding, which spans across all CG centers and try to put uh, some order and standardization uh, to achieve the modern uh, base of crop improvement and then uh, also impact. So this scheme on the left here, is a um, little bit of visualization which processes are involved but you see that everything revolves uh, around what we call the breeders equation so this is uh, the way how uh, crop improvement teams are evaluating their success means uh, genetic gain in this case we can define for the crop production and uh, that consists of the selection intensity, selection accuracy, genetic standard deviation, and the length of the uh, generation uh, progress. So with this um, TP and all these type of modeling exercises, we are trying to address this part of the equation R, the selection accuracy. Uh, why it's important, I will try to move this here. So we, as I was uh, uh, telling before, so uh, all our centers work uh, towards improvement of uh, production of agri-systems in very complex environments, in the most complex which you can imagine. So uh, just to, uh, so how do we select accurately for the situations where the yields are wildly fluctuating between the years? You can see one small example of post sorghum in India in one district, here on the bottom you have years, here you have the production. So you see that we go every year from, uh, from the crop failure to at least uh, some yield. So how to address these? That's the question. 
So many of you who have uh, seen some of our activities before wouldn't be surprised that I will start uh, talking about this, my favorite diagram, which is but generally valid. So if we want to address the productivity, it's not only about yield, yield and yield. We really have to understand that the crop production is the result of interaction between the crop production practices, crop features, in a context of given environment, uh, we can uh, call it TP. And then even beyond it, the complexity goes much more beyond because pro crop production is also the integration of many plant processes which are working dependently on what management, uh, what uh, features the plant is having uh, and uh, what is the environment in which this all interactions are happening. So what we should be aiming for, and this is just a small example with these graphics here above, uh, what we are aiming with all these TPE analyzes is at the end to optimize the uh, crop production practices with the given genetics or the traits. And these traits also, that's not just some traits, they have to be um, uh, significantly uh, linked to the uh, crop production in a given environment. Otherwise, uh, again, the breeding equation fall, falls apart. So uh, you might have a notion here that it will be very difficult to do this in vivo in the field. So uh, to address all these combinations uh, because uh, spaces, uh, resources are limited. So here is where the first uh, crop modeling tool comes to our aid because that helps us to integrate all our crop environment and uh, crop practices knowledge together and address some of these issues which are otherwise uh, very difficult to answer by doing experimentations in the field. So what uh, the crop growth model does, it integrates the properties of the crop, climate, soil and management and uh, connect them to dynamically reproduce the cropping systems. So the old approaches or old, I don't want to say old, classical envirotyping approaches, sometimes they are called mega environments or winning varieties. Uh, uh, approaches. They mostly uh, take in account the crop features. Uh, sometimes they also deal with the static information on climate, soil management sometimes. And what is the innovation here, what we call TPE, but we can call it even in different ways, is that uh, we are putting all these pieces of puzzle together. Uh, rep we are reproducing the dynamics of the cropping systems and in this type of little bit model uh, supported anal analysis we are attempting to also account to the soil plant atmosphere interaction in this type of analysis. So uh, now uh, just a few examples which I digged out. So I think Simit has done a really good uh, job uh, looking at mega environments across the globe. There is also a little bit example of peanut from uh, ICRISA. But uh, this is something, uh, some approach which I'm not so much familiar with. So I would like to ask Diego to uh, maybe talk about, uh, about this more. Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Um, so I'm, I'm going to be presenting uh, some examples of uh, the application of the MIGA environment concept and also uh, uh, trying to, to make it more clear for, for everyone and also how, how we uh, use this concept for, for crop modeling, these tools uh, for crop modeling, uh, simulation in a global scale and also climate change. Uh, so uh, this one, this uh, map that you can see here, it shows the, the Simita with mega environments uh, that uh, has uh, this example is for wheat, but we have, this is crop specific, like uh, Hannah said. So we have for, for peanut, for, for maize, for, od for other crops. So this one for wheat, you can see this, we have uh, Environment, uh, mega environments for spring wheat, for facultative wheat, and for winter wheat. And uh, each mega environment, basically they share uh, across, across uh, large regions, they share uh, like sowing time, they, they share 
uh, in approximately nor not exactly but they have uh, in terms of uh, season of the year they share the same uh, uh, sowing uh, sowing time they share they have also similar uh, weather uh, characteristics like uh, temperature range uh, rainfall uh, patterns as well and also uh, it takes into account uh, irrigation use for defining the mega environments and also disease pressure. So, for example, I'm, I'll uh, give you one example for the mega environment one. So it's uh, autumn sown. Uh, uh, it has a temperature between 11 degrees Celsius and 3 degrees Celsius in the coolest quarter. Uh, with uh, this is a minimal temperature. And the major constraints is leaf rust, stem rust, stripe rust, lodging. And there are some representative sites across large regions, for example, uh, Gangetic Valley, India, Indus Valley, Pakistan, uh, Nile Valley, Egypt, and Yaki Valley in Mexico. So uh, this, this is the, the mega environment. And here, can you go to the next slide, please? So in this, in this slide, you can see a global simulation for wheat using the mega environments to define where we place what cultivar. And, uh, and the, the management as well we have a set of uh, management background to run uh, three DSAT models. So in this example, you, you are seeing an average of the three DSAT models, the crop sim series, crop sim, and end wheat crop models uh, running for 30 years from 1980 to 2010. And, uh, and the pixels are in a half degree resolution. So, uh, and you can see in the, in the graph, the letter B in, on your left, uh, left of your screen, you can see the simulated versus observed uh, wheat yield compared with FAO. This is a national, uh, national uh, average yield. And in the letter C, on the right side, uh, you can see the simulated versus observed country uh, wheat production instead of uh, wheat yield uh, using just uh, 2007 to 2009 in this, in this, uh, in this graph. So it's, an, uh, it's the production, uh, total pr uh, national production from 2007 to 2009 compared with FAO. And uh, please next slide. So this 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 baseline we we use to compare with the future scenarios. So in this in this graph, uh, in this uh, this slide, you can see in the top uh, the climate change impacts. So you you see the RCP eight point five. So it's it's showing the the climate impact uh, 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 in response to to the to five uh, climate models, I, we have average of five climate models, and the and the response to uh, to RCP eight point five to elevated CO two and temperature. So using those three crop models, so you can see that uh, the heat the heat tolerance in the in the in the middle of the in the the map in the middle you have the combined genetic traits. So we have uh, Heat tolerance, early vigor, and late flowering, and uh, additional nitrogen fertilizer application uh, as an option to maximize genetic gains. So you can see that some areas uh, the genetic traits they work, but some areas it's it's not uh, it's not very effective. So why? Because it's the 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 environment has uh, the interaction with the genetic with the environment. GBI interaction and also management uh, plays a big role in this in the application of where we play we put uh, what cultivar and uh, what trait we, we need to focus on. So and we can see in the bottom one uh, that the nitrogen also plays a big role, uh, especially in low input uh, countries like uh, when you have uh, you have. Uh, uh, low fertilizer application, the, the genetic gains are limited by the nutrient uh, restraints. So this, this is an example of how, how we integrate the crop model with the uh, mega environment concept 
and uh, and also uh, under context of uh, climate change, how the TPE uh, concept uh, is can be applied to to decide where and to, to help uh, to find to to decide where to include what cultivar and why. So with that, I turn it over to to Hannah to continue her presentation. Thanks so much, Diego. That's really great. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So uh, that was an excellent example. Uh, I think that this is also why uh, the breeding program assessment tool uh, is recommending the same. So I think that uh, much of the audience is from CG uh, system. So uh, you might be aware of the reviews which the breeding programs are recently undergoing to actually modernize, optimize, standardize uh, for uh, to deliver the impact. So, as far as I know, at least in IPRESAT and several of the partnering organization, the recommendation number one was really to do this type of analysis in support of the targeting of the breeding efforts. And uh, these teams do not recommend it just like that, out of the blue. Uh, I believe that these uh, reviewers uh, from BPET are really well aware of what is happening outside, for example, in uh, uh, in the industry. So uh, we, uh, we follow uh, in IPRESAT several of these successful cases of ad, uh, advanced crop improvement programs and they really use and uh, this type of modeling support in their breeding programs and benefit from it largely. So my beloved example is from Corteva where they uh, and the uh, maize hybrid uh, program for US Corn Belt, where there have been a huge modeling efforts to characterize uh, what's going on in maize production systems in US. Uh, basically, they have the team to, based on this uh, environmental characterization, or we can also call it uh, TPE, uh, they designed their product in silico. And then they went uh, to uh, in vivo creating such a product and Heureka, it actually worked uh, and it was the most successful and it still is the most successful um, uh, product uh, for the U.S. Corn Belt uh, as far as I, uh, as I know. And Mark Cooper in his paper really summarized it very nicely. I like this sentence which stands for basically all what we need to know. So germplasm, genetics, phenotyping and selection combined with a clear definition of product targets, means geographical targets, are the foundation of successful breeding. So uh, this has been all well documented uh, in uh, papers, so please uh, go through it. It's a really uh, beautiful story. So this is the end of part one here. The take home message uh, is uh, that uh, at least here, we, uh, what we understood by TPE, that it is the in silico method, which is considering system dynamics and complements traditional in vivo and virotyping methods. Uh, TP is the quantitative method which provides insight into G by E by M interactions. And uh, there are many more examples out, uh, out there uh, showing that uh, the crop modeling tools, including this type of uh, TP analysis, can help crop improvement programs in targeting their uh, production pipelines and especially in the complex uh, environments which are burdened by abiotic uh, stresses. So now let's take a deep breath. <laughs> Part two is starting. So this part is more focused on what we do uh, at the Prisat. First part will be just for you who do not know very quickly what do we stand for, what we are. Then a few of the examples which uh, we are working on. And then uh, how do we project ourselves in the future? How we can build on, on these uh, analysis uh, to further support various activities which are important and the future directions. So for those who do not know, International Crop Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics uh, deal with the uh, semi-arid tropical agri-systems in Africa and South Asia. 
uh, we do have uh, six mandate crops, uh, which are traditionally known as Burman crops. And it is because these are notoriously known as being the uh, key for subsistence farming systems uh, in uh, these uh, regions of Africa and South Asia. So our mantra is sustainable demand driven inclusive agri-system improvement. And uh, today I will talk about uh, the part which deals with adaptation of cropping systems to the uh, current and future climatic risks as a function of crop properties, uh, agronomy in those target populations of environment. So here again, uh, integral part is crop improvement. And here again, excellence in breeding platform uh, comes to our uh, aid to standardize uh, and modernize these methodologies across the CG centers. So what is the baseline of it is to know what we, uh, what, uh, we try to improve. So we have the set of these product concepts which are uh, part of it is here. It's only small part. It's uh, much more extensive. So which is supposed to be specifying our target. So here I have taken the example of post rainy season sorghum uh, in southern Asia. You see straight away that those target uh, agroecologies are quite vaguely defined. You see that all Indian subcontinent and all countries are the range of resolution here. Then also a uh, vague, vague, very vague definition of uh, what kind of biotic and abiotic stress tolerances are required. But this is exactly where we come into the game to provide the quantification of these processes and, uh, and spatial temporal ta uh, targeting to transit these product concepts into the actionable product profiles. So what we are trying to do is to operationalize this concept into crop improvement and uh, we, uh, by the means of spatial temporary expansion of, uh, of whatever is known and quantification of the production environments so that we can have the precise geographically targeted uh, quanti uh, quantitatively defined product. Also, by the way, what I believe that these type of uh, analyses are integral to improve the transparency of uh, these uh, breeding programs, crop improvement uh, programs, and uh, that's the vehicle for the interdisciplinary engagement. Though, because when we clearly say and quantify what is needed, then others, other disciplines, I, I believe, can uh, much more effectively plug into the process. So this is my favorite messy slide. Don't worry about all this. What improve, what is really, what matters here is that we have a complex process. Here is the, again, example of post rainy sorghum, where at the beginning is demand for the crop products. At the end is uh, pro, uh, product acceptability in those target uh, population of environments. So uh, here in this presentation, we will be dealing with this part. So the uh, model enabled quantitative analysis of production regions and then uh, the product design. So product environments and examples. So a few examples from my brilliant colleagues, what they are working on now. Uh, for example, Amir, uh, Amir's uh, analysis of peanuts production uh, regions in India. So how do we go about it? How do we begin? First of all, we have to know where those crops are. So at least in Southern Asia, we are lucky because we have got this um, time series of uh, district level production uh, uh, for each crop and season. Those are the highlighted uh, districts here on this map. We can also cross validate, cross confirm this from the sky, from the satellite imagery, whatever GIS uh, team is doing. So these are these uh, yellow things. So and then con when we know where our crops are, we have to dig out the skeletons from the wardrobes. Because uh, 
what is still effective in national system and sometimes even in other programs is the zonations developed somewhere in the uh, 1970s uh, who knows by whom but uh, many things have changed uh, since these uh, zona zonations have been uh, developed but still they are being used and uh, there is not much to add than uh, you see for the first look that in some of those zones there is not even the crop produced anymore so we really need to uh, yeah bring evidence and to evolve all the system so then what we do when we know where our crop is as i was telling uh, we are trying to gather the baseline information and reproduce the crop dynamics uh, or system dynamics and uh, based on all these characters uh, define the homogeneous units. So the output uh, could look maybe like this for peanuts. This is Amir's work. So uh, now we can see maybe even more granularity of uh, these production regions than we could have uh, anticipated at the beginning. Uh, so now when we have this type of information, we can start quantifications, not only how much is being produced, what is the average, but also what are the yield gaps, how much of those yield gaps can be accounted for various uh, abiotic stressors. But again, we have still a quite uh, way to go to put on board all national systems and standardize uh, using uh, or cross-validate and standardize usage of these uh, unified uh, methods for defining the regions. Because, yeah, national system, you see that when we overlay the major production regions in peanuts with their testing sites, then, uh, yeah, you see that maybe much more efficient, uh, much uh, more resources can be saved to test efficiently. When we combine it with those old zones and the statistics which is being applied. So right now, for all these zones, you see how much of heterogeneity it deals with. Uh, the data is being clapped together and based on these, uh, the variety are being released. So nevertheless, we will, prog uh, we will keep progressing. What, we, what the main message of this slide is that uh, this type of very simple analysis can be used to um, strategically set the multi-location trials and so optimize the resources which are being poured into multi-location testing and statistical treatment. So uh, again, summarizing, uh, prioritization, quantification, transparency is our main motto here. So what we have done, uh, so Amir has worked not only on peanuts, uh, he has also done a good job characterizing the chickpea in uh, India. We are venturing more and more to the production systems in Africa to do the similar analysis. And the most uh, advanced uh, stuff which we have done with uh, modeling tools is really the post trainer sorghum in India. And that uh, example I will bring forward. So uh, when we have these zones, what does it mean for us? What we can do? So here, we can start uh, seeing in more details what is actually happening in those uh, zones. So we can uh, see what are, for example, the water stress scenario that is uh, scenarios uh, prevalent in those regions. You can uh, here on the x-axis thermal time, on the y-axis uh, supply demand uh, water of the water, so stress index. Uh, its effect on yield can be then quantified. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, works uh, not only for the water stress, it, works, uh, it would work for any abiotic uh, stressors, for example, heat. We can also quantify the effect of management. The hot topic is now to see whether we can also use these types of ana analysis to quantify the effect of El Nino, La Nina, Southern oscill Oscillation to basically predict the season type. So what I mean to say here in this slide is that we can uh, quantify the effect on production of, for example, these uh, stressors, but we can also see what is the frequency of occurrence of these stressors, which is shown here. So we can say that, for example, in this region, the major 
uh, stresses which are depriving the yield are really more prevalent there here. So we should really care for it here, but maybe not that much in those uh, um, uh, surrounding areas. So what we can do further, if we have the setup for this uh, TP analysis and the basic in place. So this is uh, actually very huge exercise. We can start uh, going towards production design, evaluate of factorial combinations of all those G by E by M uh, combinations across the spatial temporal scales. So last time when we have done it, it resulted in uh, 14 terabytes of data. So you may agree that it's not really how to deal with it. It's not really comprehensive. So we were trying to uh, work out how to condense this type of information in very comprehensive way. So we found out this. So uh, we have prepared, and you please go there and give us the feedback of this website. It's the first version, first prototype. So for Rabi Sorghum in India, we have created this uh, uh, web tool to uh, visualize what are the achievable yields in the rain fed conditions for the Rabi sorghum in India uh, and what combinations of management and genetics will help you to attain that maximum uh, production or sustainable production in those uh, particular grids. So uh, the vision of all this is that we would like to evolve this uh, for our st stakeholders to uh, primarily crop improvement uh, programs, but hopefully consequently even for, uh, for the um, uh, governments, for example, for the farmer organizations, for the NGOs on ground. But for now, for the use in crop improvement programs, we have a vision to develop something like a G by M toolbox, where uh, across the region of the interest, we could see what would be the combination of the management practices in different uh, soil types, let's say. Uh, for example, here is the simulation of the sowing window, of course, uh, planting densities, uh, nitrogen application, but also the genetics. So here we tried to look at uh, crop duration, of course. Crop vigor means the speed of uh, canopy establishment and our favorite trans transpiration responsiveness uh, to the vapor pressure deficit, which is the uh, important part of the or, the or the important component of transpiration efficiency. So again, on this single uh, example, I can demonstrate very clearly that there is no one fit all silver bullet. We need to be really geographically targeted and know which level of trade and which level of management goes together uh, to achieve the optimum uh, production. And uh, at the end, we conduct, uh, condensed all these uh, 14 terabytes of data, not only into these sets of beautiful maps and IT tools, but one single map, which can be used in breeding as those target regions, which now are well characterized. We can even say that uh, that is even uh, more beyond the TP. It's actually the homogeneous response units. So the analysis was such that we could presume that in one of these, uh, colorful units, the response of the crop to management or genotype, genotype intervention is supposed to be more homogeneous than in those other regions. So that's where we are transiting to, from TPE to homogeneous response units. But whatever we call it, the main thing we define what we mean. So now uh, the future directions. So all these analyses uh, are nice. We have got a lot of colorful maps, some uh, beautiful uh, geobiophysical characters of those production regions. However, it goes much uh, more complex, much beyond it, if we really mean to uh, more effectively address the issues faced uh, by crop improvement programs. So definitely, and Diego already is, have spoken about it, biotic stresses needs to be overlaid or uh, involve in, be involved in this type of clustering analysis. Important thing about market and market corridors. So these initiatives are just beginning. 
across the CG centers. Very important thing, which is maybe very different from the developed uh, countries situation and which is actually, uh, yeah, which is the most complex, much more complex than uh, TPE is to deal with social economic status of the population. And remember our target stakeholders are subsistence, uh, smallholder farming system, low input systems in those worse environments, uh, which you can imagine to produce the crops. And then uh, again, Diego talked about it in ICRISAT, uh, we do some uh, little bit of analysis, but we definitely have to do more because this is one of the few options we have to look into the effects of the future climates and uh, allow the crop improvement teams to account for this future variability. So just at the end, uh, on a, to end on the positive note, so we uh, managed to have one uh, very brilliant example where we could link our outputs from the crop modeling in sorghum with the social economic analysis. Uh, so, and then uh, you will see what effect it had. So we had this information from our social economic team on this uh, map on the left. Where, uh, where there is a basically ratio of livestock per capita. So if you have a green color, you have more, uh, more cattle than people. And if you have uh, a red color, it's vice versa. So what we know that since this is a dual uh, purpose crop, in some regions, people may need more the grain and in another, they may need more of the stover. So what would happen if we would uh, have these two types uh, of um, crop, uh, precisely targeted in those uh, greenish or reddish area rather than one crop type. So Heureka, that is $200 uh, uh, million dollars in the pockets of the farmers, just accounting for the different demand for different uh, crop product. So I think, uh, yeah, I think this is definitely the positive way uh, forward, which we need to follow. So, Part two is uh, ending take home message. So uh, I try to summarize hopefully what you have heard here. So TPE complements, not replaces, complements. Many people think that we are just trying to take over. It's not that we are trying to be of more help with the tools which are now available. So we complement traditional crop improvement methods and enable spatial temporarily expansion and quantification of production environments, precise geographical targeting of uh, G and M interventions. So we also see, or I believe, and I see it, this is just my opinion, that this type of analysis are really the vehicle for transparency, quantification, effective inter interdisciplinary engagement of uh, crop in the crop improvement teams. And that's a hot topic nowadays uh, for those uh, who are sitting in CG centers. And it's also a gateway for developing of precise product design as a next level. That's the beyond. <laughs> So thanks so much for your attention and uh, I will be looking forward for your questions. Please look at our website and we will be happy for interacting with you further. So the next one is going uh, to be Stefan Einarsson. So Stefan, if you can share your screen with your presentation. Okay. So I'm just going to talk to you about a pilot project that we're doing right now, um, which is about crop uh, growth modeling in the EBS with myself and Diego. So the outline of this is that we've got the a pilot project that I'm going to talk about it, talk about what is EIB, what is EBS. These terms may be sort of known to many of you, um, but maybe not to some. What is our near-term plan? What have we accomplished? What are our challenges? Um, what are we doing within DSAT and some final thoughts? Um, so for the pilot project, the, the thought is, can we um, incorporate a robust crop modeling tool like DSAT into the CG's larger enterprise breeding system within the context of EIB? Uh, potentially, this would give a powerful modeling tool to every center that adopted it. 
Um, in the current configuration that we're working on right now, that would allow people to have access to things like um, Simit's high performance computing resources as part of the engine for modeling. Um, just as a review for many of you, uh, what is excellence in breeding? Um, it's a CG sort of process for modernizing breeding programs targeting at the developing world for greater impact on food and nutrition security, climate change, adaptation, and development. Drawing from innovations on public and private sector, the platform will provide access to cutting edge tools, services, and best practices, um, application-oriented training, and practical advice. Um, these, I won't go over all, all of these, but these are the, the different modules that are involved in EIB um, right now. And then, uh, since our project works within EBS, what is that? Um, that's uh, CG's plant breeders currently rely on a suite of different software products to make use of data that's crucial to developing better varieties. Um, developed under the CG's EIB, the EBS um, aims to provide a single solution that links data across um, new and existing applications so that the entire breeding um, uh, data workflow from experiment creation to analytics can be accessed from a single user dashboard. So that's, that's the idea. Um, this is just one small example. And if you or one, one piece of the, the whole EIB, this is uh, the, the schematic for the EBS. And um, what we're working on, our pilot program is involved in the analytics, which is near the center, and the environ typing, which is down in the, the lower right-hand portion of the screen. So <clears throat> just to give you an update on EBS, um, the development is, of the system is currently underway with the goal of providing a minimal viable implementation for pilot users at CIMIT and at ERIE this year. Um, more advanced functions, institutions, and crops will be added to EBS over the next number of years. Um, so what have we done with, with our CERV model? Okay, we've taken a sort of a crop growth model. We start with the simple model and we've sort of adapted it into the EBS platform. Um, we've integrated also DSAT into the EBS utilizing the high performance computing cluster, um, which gives it great capabilities. And we've begun creating simple user interfaces and some basic output. Um, what are our challenges? Like, like many different folks, um, ensuring continued financial support. And then right now we're, we're a pilot, you know, um, it would be great if we were sort of part of the full integration into the EBS. So that's, that's something next. So what are we doing within in DSAT? Um, the EBS uses crop models to classify environments and support breeding decisions. We're working majorly with wheat, maize, and rice um, with DSAT. And as has been talked about earlier, we're working with mega environments um, involving heat, drought, and the interaction between heat and drought. Um, for our modeling, we're looking at heat, the del deleterious effects of um, above optimum temperatures on photosynthesis and leaf senescence. The phenological development is faster affecting source sink balance in warm environments. And we're also modeling sort of plants are more sensitive during anthesis and grain filling uh, phenological stages. And then with drought, you know, we're modeling the soil water balance calculated in a daily step under irrigated and and rain-fed conditions, uh, looking at the soil moisture, the evapotranspiration and water efficiency, the water stress effects on growth and photosynthesis are quantified, the ratio of root supply to transpiration demand, and we're evaluating the possible yield reduction caused by soil and plant water 
deficits. Um, for our system right now, we're looking at um, the typical management of a complete set of data, and we're making it so that we can look at any point on the globe. Um, we're working right now on a user interface that allows people to enter their own data um, and output variables of crop growth, development, and yield. Um, besides environmental stress, stresses, indices are, are sort of provided. Um, just final remarks. Um, crop models can be part of the EBS system supporting breeders um, to better understand where and why wheat, maize, rice varieties would have more success. Um, heat and drought tolerant varieties could be tested through crop model simulations in many regions of the globe regarding their viability and level of expected yields. Ultimately, the whole system together um, with tools will help breeders to deliver better varieties that meet the farmer's needs. Um, and with that, I'd like to just um, sort of uh, thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UK Aid, and the team, which also involves Diego, Victor, Jeff, Giago, um, Tom, Marco, and Maricelis. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Stefan. So we are going to move very quickly uh, to the question and answer sections. We have received so many questions, so please continue typing in the question and answer section. Let me start with the first question uh, that goes for Dana. So I think some of the, of the participants from the webinar are a little bit confused about the TPE definition. So um, they ask whether TPE is defined as the output of a crop growth model, model combined with management practice, or they also say what, uh, dif uh, what TPE, TPE analysis differ differs from uh, simply using a crop growth model with all the required inputs. So um, Jen, I don't know if you can make a couple of more yes. clarifications in order like people have clear what TPE is uh, that is complementary to, to crop modeling and not. Yeah, so yeah, so maybe I will try to share the presentation again. Like uh, it's also possible that our definition is not what others uh, have. And that's also the reason why we are meeting here to standardize the terms. So how do we understand uh, in uh, this community what, what TP is? And let me go back to these slides. Can you see that? Yes, yes, we can see yes. Uh, so uh, maybe those those types of, of questions are coming from the people who do not have quite understanding of what uh, crop modeling approaches is. So uh, the classical approaches, and uh, I hope I will answer these questions, deal with these type of uh, static analysis of these type of uh, indices uh, which deals with climate, crop, soil and management but statically so many times uh, crop improvement teams what they have been doing in past they select the panel of the diverse germplasm they grow it across the globe and the winning variety uh, then uh, defines what is actually the environment above so the crop is used as the indicator so instead of using uh, the crop per se as the integrator indicator of the environment we are now having the modeling tool which also takes in account all these indexes but it is the set of hopefully process-based mechanistic algorithms which replicate the biological processes and all those interactions in silico so it's like growing your crop uh, in the computer and then uh, accounting for the dynamics of the growth and the interactions as well. So it is, uh, let's say, that classical envirotyping plus the dynamic component to it, uh, which now we can uh, account for because we have these uh, crop modeling tools. I, I hope I have answered. <laughs> I think it's not clear for some attendees. Um if they have to link the data with crop modeling or is it a tool that replaces the classic crop models but i think no. your question 
okay. model is part of it. So you have to pour into the model this input. This is the input to that uh, set of algorithms. Without that, you cannot run model. You have to state your initial conditions. And those are these, which, uh, yeah, which we can measure, which we get from the ground. And uh, yeah, which uh, till, till like few uh, decades back were the only available uh, source for doing some type of envirotyping. The moment where models came in the place, we are able to run all this through the in silico processes, which uh, replicates the biological processes. And also look at, for example, what was that soil water content uh, during the antithesis in that particular season in latitude and longitude x, y. So that's the advantage. We are adding the as like a temporal scale. We are adding the dynamic components to this static uh, classical approach. But it, uh, yeah, but it uses, it's not replacing crop modeling TPE type uses uh, the, these tools. I hope I have clarified it a bit. Yeah, I think it is um, clarified now. One, I tend to say that, Jana, the trials you were mentioning in your talk will be part of the product profile definition and not the TPE definition. The role of socioeconomic study in the TPE will be linked ra uh, rather to the availability of farmers to buy inputs for a successful cropping season. So that's a comment of, of uh, one attendee. Actually, I see uh, there are a series of questions which uh, go about uh, this topic. So basically, it's a tool uh, which we use to uh, define product profiles, to geographically define and quantify the product profile. So it's a tool which is uh, yeah, which which help us to, in my opinion, transit from uh, product concepts, which are on a high level to the really to set them on the specific geographies with a very uh, quantitative approach, which is, uh, well, hopefully my CG based colleagues would agree on that. Question for yourself is considering semi-arid tropics uh, with uncertain start of rainfall or ending, how can one apply the TPE concept for sorghum and pearl millet, for example? Well, <laughs> Yeah, this is um, if it's this a is long exactly one, what this yeah. is exactly what the crop modeling does. So it accounts for different uh, start of the rainy season, and that's the beauty of it. So we have all this climatic information, and so that we can set the condition specific uh, to what farmers are doing. So, for example, for sorghum and millet, uh, when we reproduce the system dynamics, we also reproduce the most likely management, which we uh, know from the f uh, that uh, is going on in those farming systems. So we know that, for example, for millet and sorghum in post rainy season, in uh, millet in rainy season, farmers do start planting after the first rainfall. So the similar condition will be set in the uh, in the crop model. And then, of course, there are there are many many uh, actually questions about the model uh, uh, model validation. So this is not just that we press the button and it's done. It actually requires years of understanding and gathering the data, which are very scarce in these uh, in these systems. So sometimes we have to even uh, produce our own data to get uh, confidence in our uh, model setup. So uh, yeah, so the model validation is definitely the, the utmost important thing uh, to do if we are attempting these approaches. Yeah, and that's why that's why good modeling uh, practices are really has to be has to be followed. Now I'm going to address a question to Diego. How does TPE analysis address the microclimatic conditions brought about by human habitation, such as urban heat island effects running per urban agriculture? And can predictive global climate change model address such effects, given the rapid urbanization occurring in major urban environments in developing countries? So one, one uh, thing that is, is uh, getting more and more attention more besides the, the warmer temperatures uh, in, due to the human uh, intervention, the CO2 increase and, and increase in temperature in the future scenario is also uh, raising a, 
some concerns the increase in ozone and pollution from the from the cities and uh, and the crop models and the and also other TPE tools they they are uh, trying also to address those uh, those topics and especially for uh, for crop modeling that's that's what uh, uh, that's my my expertise we we have uh, some some studies with the ozone increase and running for large areas and there are some there are already publications and also I'd like to uh, to emphasize that we have an agmip uh, community uh, working on the on those topics like ozone and also uh, pollution is something that is coming as well and, uh, as a concern for the for simulations and for TP analysis. Okay, uh, the next question is also for you, um, Diego. Yes. Uh, you, yeah. Uh, under the climate change scenario, we cannot think of launching any breeding program, program without a well-defined target environment encompassing the prevailing socioeconomic scenario. TPE can be split into smaller breeding targets for optimal precise output. So can you yeah, comment a little bit of that? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, it's it's very important uh, when when we emphasize, for example, when we uh, do this kind of analysis, like global simulations or some kind of uh, large areas uh, simulation. We we also depend on the socioeconomic for the to measure the impact of that. and also to take that to the farmer. So it, it's not a, it's not a matter of that we have the results and how how it could help the farmer how it, how it could help the to to make difference to make impact so it's uh, it's uh that's that's how it's important and we have in in, in CIMIT also uh, a work on that so every every time we we do uh, some some analysis some technologies to take to the farmer it it goes through the through the socioeconomic specialists and and also economists to to measure the, the impact so it's yeah it's a very important uh, point thank you um diego for this clear answer the next question goes to stefan uh, is there any information about the results of simple model compared to dsat model i think uh Diego, you might you might have a better sense for that as far as the comparison between the two, between the simple and DSAT. What what do you think? I, I would say that uh, the those two models, maybe two two things to compare those two models is that the simple model is like it it says uh, in the name, it's simple, so it doesn't take into account the uh, nitrogen stresses and uh, some of the the processes like phenology is a kind of simplified way, and uh, so that's that's how I would say the comparison between two two models are. Uh, it's not that they they are one is better than the other. It's kind of a different uh, objective. So in in this way, uh, to use in in our in our system, we try to st you start with the simple model because it's a simple approach. Then we go to a more complex approach that is the DSAT model. So that's that's. Uh, I don't know if I I answer the, the question, but yep. Um, so unfortunately, we are a little bit over the time. Please, uh, if you have some more questions, continue typing them in the question and answer. We will try to reply the questions after the webinar. We will upload the questions that have not been answered during the presentation and are relevant to the topic. We are going to reply this. We will add them close to the webinar recording. And I'm going to pass the turn to Matthew Reynolds, the leader of the crop modeling community of practice who has a question to the panelists and can do a, a grab up. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, um, everyone. Um, I just would like to ask a question before wrapping this up. So if one were to make a G by E type of cluster analysis with germplasm that is fully resistant to diseases and pests, and then make an analysis where the germplasm is susceptible, 
for sure you would get a completely different uh, set of clusters. So the question is, how does the, how does the old approach, the TP approach, reconcile those uh, biotic and abiotic factors and, and, and establish priorities between them? That's for any of you. So if I may, thanks so much, uh, Matthew. So uh, I was talking about this. So right now, this approach is really only to uh, classify and cluster biogeophysical properties of the environment in the dynamic way. Uh, the pests and diseases are not yet there, but we know that it's a priority for many crop improvement teams. So that has to still be worked out and add on to this. So either at least some information on the geographical distribution of, and of these disease pressures, or there are also the dynamic models which uh, predict the risks of uh, diseases pressures. So I believe that in future, we will be able to hopefully link this information and also prioritize because again, the product profile for some, uh, for some products, uh, the diseases and pests are the priority. Uh, for some, maybe not that much. Well, okay, yeah. I think that uh, is, is a very key element for many crops. Uh, it might be worth considering nesting within uh, biotic stress environments because they, they very often are the ones that have the most influence. Anyway, um, that would be an interesting discussion. We can have some other time. So I just want to make the comment that um, this is such an important area, defining target environments. It's really, it really is the beginning of, of any, any crop improvement program is to know where you're aiming and everything else follows from that. So this is such an important area um, and it's great that we were able to address this. So thank you very much. Uh, Stefan, Gianna, Diego, for your excellent presentations and for everyone who participated and for the questions you've sent. And um, as Annabelle said, we hope to be able to answer most of those. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And please don't forget to join our newsletter for get informed about future webinars and check our website for the webinar recording and the questions and the presentations that we will try to uh, upload them next week. So thank you for attending and thank you, special thanks to all the panelists for great presentation and all the four for being here. Thanks to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.